All right, well, I'm going to get it going here. Get it going, man. Just get have, it going. Yeah, let's. I have, uh, yeah, that's fine. Let's go live. I have, I have this kind of thing, Randall. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are. This is uh, Cosmography, the Randall one. Carlson podcast. We're still setting things up. Randall's taking notes on things that he needs to work on. Doing a little yes. behind the scenes work here, but we didn't want to go too late. Randall always makes yeah, us I'm... late. It's your fault, Randall. The, yes, the audience the needs things, to know. I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm making a note right here to really to begin to work on my uh, my tendency for emotional outbursts <laughs> to try to get that under control. Like, it's got to be just right. Okay. So yeah, so thanks for everybody in the chats for joining us. Uh, we got we got plenty of things we can talk about. I know Randall has things on his mind. Brad has promised to give us a full lecture tonight. Isn't that right, Brad? He's not even listening. Yes. Because <laughs> uh, I have to practice for the April event that's coming up. Oh, yeah. Are we allowed yeah, to talk about that? Big, big news. Yes. Uh, I don't I don't know if George wants to be hush-hush about that, but, I mean, we already talked. Well, we talked about it the other day, but that was recorded, so that won't come out for several weeks. So, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, well, if, if George hasn't talked to you, he's building a website, so I think we need to wait till we have a website okay. that people can go to. But. But yeah, ultimately there's a an event coming in Asheville in April of 23. Yes. That's Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville, North Carolina. Brad's going to Mundo. Brad, you're going to be be there too? Yes, sir. I'm going to be there. Kyle's going to well, be there. And the uh, and, and Kyle's going to be there too? Yeah. What I'm going to Yeah, you better be. What I'm going to elaborate on if if I get my slot, but there's uh multiple people that are trying to vie for space because it's a uh slam bang lineup. Um what we talk about on the episode that's going to come out in a couple of days uh is the planetary scale movement of water. So that's yes. more or less going to be the title of, of my talk. And uh, I'm going to get oh. into that. Oh, and uh, an hour is not going to be enough. To that. <laughs> an hour will not be enough. So, yeah, me, well, me too. That's going to be fun to put that together. Well, we'll Russ, we'll have to make sure we get seats, you know, front and center at ringside and, and yeah. uh, you know, give Brad a taste of what it's like to be heckled. Yes. Heckling. I can't wait to be able to heckle I Brad totally on stage. I know. I tell you what, Russ, <laughs> I'll be heckled, you be Jekyll. <laughs> and, uh, it's a deal. <laughs> I, I do have actually heckle and Jekyll costumes, so. All right. Oh, my God. So we can show up in costume. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a video with uh, with a, some strong rock and roll to get the thing started. So everybody's just going to be mesmerized and oh, pinned man. to their seat. So All I don't right. think you're going to be able to say anything. Is it going to be a, a, a whole Rush soundtrack to your... <laughs> it is not Rush. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I might have to... I don't know. I might have to... I might have to approve this. You might have to give you a preview. <laughs> you might run it by me for to see if I approve. Of... Say no, hello man, rock out to the man. rocks topography. Rock effing out, Brad. Go ahead, man. Well, I got to get people's attention, so that's my my goal. That's right. Okay. Well. Here the, we are the, live. Yeah, we are live. People are On watching. Monday. Chat is rolling. <laughs> Jeez. Welcome, y'all. <laughs> Speed time for a beer. Oh, yeah. It's well, we, we do want to say, and uh, we've got a couple spots left in the Scablands tours, right? So that's that's something we want to keep letting sure. people know. If you've got like a last minute thing that maybe I can make this work in my schedule or I haven't been yet and oh my God, I want to go. Now now's the time to jump in. There's just a few spots left for uh, late September Scablands tours. You know, the the, tire, the, the the term, the working term for that landscape out there, scab land, that doesn't really, you know, to somebody who doesn't know the story behind it, that doesn't suck. Scab land? What? Who wants to go see scab land? Yeah. You know, scab? But, uh, but yeah, we need to come up with a better, a better name, a better title for that. Although okay. scab land goes back to the original settlers who found that there was, they were very limited in what they could grow in their crops because you had, you know, mile after mile of bare eroded basalt. 
that was not suitable for farming. And so they referred to it as scab land. And, you know, when you, we've looked at aerial photos in this. So those of us who've been, those of the listeners that have been following along have seen photos if they haven't actually been there for themselves now. And from the air, you really can get almost, it does look like a, a landscape with scabs on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a small, it's one, maybe 15% of the entire suite of land features that have recorded the world's most awesome floods that have ever happened that we know of in the history of this planet. Now, there have been other floods, of course, that were probably even greater, but we have no record of those because, you know, when you get a flood that's gushing along over the land, hundreds, hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second, after that flood is over, whatever was there before, it's gone. Whether it was natural or, or human made, it's gone. Anyways, this is one of the most spectacular landscapes on the planet, if you understand the story behind it. And this is your opportunity to get in uh, an awesome event in an awesome place that'll be a lot of fun. We've got the resort there, the Soap Lake Resort, that, that we're going to be staying at to use as our base of operations. And this is going to be really, hopefully, everything just falling into place. Well, Weather is like usually good. It's unique to the planet. It's it's where it's most obviously imprinted, a catastrophic flood right there in eastern Washington. And it's also, and again, I'm, I mentioned this on the, the podcast 87 that's about to come out in a couple of days. It's the most like the surface of Mars mm -hmm. on the whole Earth planet. It's the most like Mars because it shows these catastrophic flooding features. Yes, it's a, it's a, an analog for Martian landscapes That's and word. Yep. scientists, astronauts, and those who would have an interest, planetary geologists have gone to study those land features in person on site to try to gain greater insight into what they're looking at it on Mars. Because Mars and earth have these in common that they've had these gigantic, inconceivably huge floods that have taken place. And Brad said a term coined by, uh, Victor Baker and his uh, Russian counterpart, I believe, or Chinese counterpart. I've forgotten now. Oh, my gosh. Matsu, Japanese, uh, probably, and Clute. Yeah, and Clute, yeah. So there was a three of them that in the 90s came out with that paper where there was, you know, the guys who are studying paleohydrology, the study of ancient water flows, had been looking at this for 20 and 30 years and, and all came to the agreement that that the best descriptive term or phrase to describe what happened and what's going on is what br the title of Brad's talk, the planetary scale movement of water. Well, I can't wait to see it. Pretty intense. Yeah. And the other one was uh, something about immense torrents. And that, and that was from 140 years ago, almost. Yeah. He, well, Alfred Tyler and, Oh right, seventy-five yep. something about uh, is that a website for like operation of illegally? immense torrents? Sorry, Kyle. Bad joke. Never mind. Just keep going. <laughs> Not only a bad joke, a super nerdy one. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Come on, Kyle. Repeat it. So I, I asked if that was a website for downloading stuff illegally. <laughs> illegally. Torrents. Mega torrents or whatever. What did you call it, Brad? Immense. Immense, immense torrents. torrents. Yeah. The yeah. operation of immense torrents. Well, immense, yeah, That's immense where you can is get the the, all the Rush songs that were ever created for free. That's right. <laughs> Every episode of the X-Files in one download. But see, so Brad's a big fan of Rush, right? So yeah. immense torrents, we're looking at water rushing on a gigantic scale. There so it is. There it is. The connection has been made. If Brad reason. hadn't been, see, Brad hadn't been a Rush fan, none of this would have happened. None of it would have happened. No. <laughs> yeah, trickle just wouldn't have been the same. <laughs> trickles, the trickles. <laughs> There's a band name for you, Kyle. <laughs> trickle. <laughs> the trickles. <laughs> yeah, the moderate trickles is what you want. <laughs> <laughs> moderate. <laughs> All right, we got a question. Hey, uh, the daily you may have an answer. The, maybe the daily Texian five dollar super chat. Thank you very much. Says Brad Randall Brothers. Have you ex explored Carl Monk's The Code? He finds GPS coordinates built into megalithic structures and mounds with simple math. 
I have been aware of Carl Monk's work for decades, and no, I have to confess, I haven't. I haven't looked either. into it. I, I heard superficially it, a couple of times I did, um, but got distracted. I think before I could really grasp the essence of it. But I do think that yes, I think that that's perhaps supportive of this idea of sacred geography that ancient cultures were very interested in where on the earth they were placing uh, their handiwork, if you will. I don't think that was just random. And I think we could go through and make a strong case that there were ancient cultures that had a much more sophisticated understanding of geography and geodesy than they've been given credit for. I think we can already say that they, without a whole lot of ambiguity, that they had uh, a much more sophisticated understanding of astronomy that they have been given credit for. But to that, we could add some other things like geography and geodesy and geometry. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I'm not going to evaluate or judge Carl's work having not looked at it, but yeah, I should, I should, and probably at some point will, but gosh, darn it. There's so many things to learn, but it sure is fun. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, I think when I was about seven or eight, I discovered how much fun it was learning things. In spite of being forced into public schools. In schooling, yeah. In spite of that. Um, you know, it wasn't too bad, uh, although there was an episode in second grade where I, had a, I, I learned a profound lesson about human nature. So there was a new kid that came to school. It's probably the middle of the year, new kid. And he's, um, you know, first day in class. And of course, so then he didn't know anybody. This is second grade. And, um, you know, I didn't say have any interaction with the kid or anything, but then we come to lunch and we all go to lunch and I had a bag lunch. I took a bag lunch. My mother would fix me a, well, I don't know what, <clears throat> maybe peanut butter and jelly or pimento cheese or, you know, the things we ate as kids back then. So we go to lunch and I go to um, take out my um, my sandwiches and stuff. And I find that there's a pair of scissors in there. Now, these are the kind of scissors that you'd give to kids. They're not real scissors. They're just, you know, kid scissors with blunt ends. And I go, why is this? I'm thinking, why is this in here? But, oh, well. So I stuck it in my shirt pocket. Lunch is over. And we're all headed back to class, kind of randomly walking down the sidewalk, a sidewalk, the hallway. And I see that the new kid, he's ahead of me there. So I'm going to go up like, you know, and be a, be a good kid and say hello and introduce myself to him. And I just happened to be holding those scissors in my hand. So I had the, the round there where you put your fingers was up, you know, and, and just holding them by the end of the scissors. And I'm, I just walked up behind him and I tapped him on the back with the scissors, like rather than my finger. And this kid turns around and he looks and he sees the, the, the scissors and he goes, Wah! and he starts screaming and he runs into the teacher and tells the teacher that I stabbed him. Oh, jeez! Told the teacher I stabbed him. She didn't. Oh, and she didn't even stop to let me draw a breath. She comes running out at me when I come into, in the door didn't let me explain or give my side. This kid was putting on such a good act. She just grabbed me by the collar and drug me over, opened the coat rack, threw me in there on all of the old wet, you know, and muddy uh, <laughs> boots that kids were wearing and made me lay in there on that, on that pile of stuff for the rest of the day. Wow. This is a true story without embellishment, without exaggeration. I don't know. I'd like to get the uh, account of, a, of an eyewitness. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to tell us that you stabbed somebody with kid scissors. <laughs> no, I, I didn't stab the kid. But I tell you what, exactly I story. wanted to afterwards. Mr. Friendly. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, so I've been punished now for stabbing this kid. And I didn't really stab him. But since I've already been punished... Now you might shouldn't I now be able to stab him <laughs> with impunity? Because I mean I've been I've been punished, right? So anyway, like I said, that was a profound hmm. lesson in human nature. And I never did figure out what this kid's problem was, but I sure had fantasies about like there was no follow up later in the school year. No, there wasn't, regrettably. There was a thought, well. 
when I was in sixth grade or was it fifth grade? So I'm, I'm, I've transferred. So see, I was up there and this was in Minnesota where all this happened, you know, this was during the winter. That's why you had the closet full of galoshes. galoshes so by the time yeah. I got to sixth grade, now I'm moved to Pineville, Louisiana, living just outside of Pineville, Louisiana, and I'm going to Pineville grammar school. And, um, so I don't know. You guys remember, did you guys ever have tether ball? I mean, I know that that's yeah, been outlawed yeah. now because it's so dangerous, you know, and could probably cause irreparable harm to poor, you know, fragile children that are playing it. But you remember tether ball, right? Yes. So oh, yeah. the idea was you have this pole with a rope and a ball on it. You're knocking it and you're trying to swing it around and, and you, you win when you get your all the way completely wrapped around the pole, right? Napoleon Dynamite was a pro at that. Pro at that. Well, I wasn't too bad myself. But so so there was these two red-haired twins that went to that school. Now, that should be a danger signal right there. Now, they, they were guys, but, you know, just two red-haired twins. So they really, they were identical twins. So one day I'm out on the playground at recess, and I'm hitting the tether ball by myself there, and then, one of the red-haired twins comes up to me and, and challenges me to a game of tetherball. I said, all right. So it was fierce. We, for the next five minutes, it's back and forth, back and forth. And finally, I prevailed. I was able to dominate. I won. So I'm kind of strutting there. <laughs> I beat you. So meanwhile, the tetherball has kind of come on wrap. So, you know, it's got a long, I don't know, six foot cord on it so he gets the end of the cord and starts swinging it around just when i turn around he swings that thing up and hits me upside the head knocks me unconscious i mean that's the only time i've ever been knocked on now that was the first time of two times i'm not going to talk about the second time because you guys know that story yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's got these certain salacious the one details where I that we better you. stay away from <laughs> so anyways he knocks me out and then you know, I come to like, you know, 20 or 30 seconds later and he's nowhere in sight. And so I, man, I am pissed. So I go and I'm hunting down, hunting, looking around the, um, the, the, the schoolyard there for him. And I knew the bell was going to ring pretty soon. We're going to all have to go back in. So I had to find him to, ha to, to, to ha seek restitution here. And, uh, I see him, I see him up at the lavatories and I go, yeah, I got you now. You And I run up there and I run up. And I go grab him and I start shaking him. I'm ready to start beating the crap out of him and whatever I was going to do to him. I don't know. I hadn't, I like, I hadn't planned this out beyond, you know, confronting him, but I had him there ready to clobber him. Yeah. It wasn't and he's like, it was... he's like, what, man, what, what you, what's going on, man? What are you doing? What are you doing? And then I realize he doesn't have the same shirt on. And it's the I twin. realize I'm there like uh, ready to. <laughs> It's his brother, <laughs> his twin brother. I'm ready to throttle the poor, poor kid. <laughs> and it's the wrong guy, you know? So I felt, I felt a bit contrite. Well, he was probably a little bit used to that. If his, if his twin was What's the kind of guy that would knock somebody out when they weren't paying attention, he probably had, he probably got beat up on behalf of his blame twin it on multiple his brother, times. Wasn't me. Yeah. I don't know. You know, twins i guess they're not you know there was another pair of twins that went there and i don't remember their name but one guy was just as nice a guy and friendly and then his brother was a complete you know what and constantly trying to start fights with people and wow tried to start fights with me on three or four occasions and i just ignored him but so i thought to myself well okay they certainly maybe look alike but they don't have the same personality so that was another important lesson for me in human nature we got some great <laughs> comments from the chat. Yeah. Oh, really? One of them is suggesting that they switch shirts. <laughs> the old twin <laughs> shirt switching trick. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> well, the, it was. Uh, uh, Classic. I'm wonder, I Not very often, but Another question. occasionally I will wonder, what are those guys doing today? Yeah. Another question. Where is, are uh, they? Why They're probably you... doing a podcast somewhere. <laughs> Was it? Okay, the other question was, why, why did you stab the guy with scissors? <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, there's lot, there are lots of scissor stabbing comments. Be a stab. <laughs> I'm Aha! sure. It's, it's a, this would have been 1958. And I know that after that, yeah, there were a lot of scissor stabbing. Stabbing. Okay, we do have it. We got a, a super chat oh. here from Jason Moskowitz. He's a, he's a longtime supporter. 
That's right. Uh, uh, thanks, Coming Jason. To, 20 get, bucks. Get, he okay, says, hey, gang. Jason. He says, was hoping Randall could go into Odin compared to Thoth uh, or Tahuti. If they are the same and how the same or how the same guys come to appear in multiple cultures as well as the relation of Elder Futark? Futh. Futhark, 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 yeah. Futhark to Gematria and other numerology. Mm-hmm. So Odin compared to Thoth, and then. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's a good question, and it's it's one that man we could dive into that for a whole episode. Actually, um, the 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 pronunciation I learned for. Uh, what you're saying, Thoth. Thoth now, this was Thoth. from, you know, when I went on Egypt, to Egypt tour, I had a Egyptologist. She was PhD Egyptologist from Egypt. She was Egyptian herself. And I was always wondering how to pronounce that name exactly. She pronounced it this way. And I've, of all the her, the variances I've heard of it, this is my favorite. Tahot. Tahot. Yeah, Tahot. Yeah. Tahot. We heard it as Tahoti, yeah. too. Tahoti. 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 Yeah. There's multiple ways. Tahuti, right. Yeah. Right. But well, Tahuti. you know, that's a question, and I don't have an answer. Was Odin equivalent to Hot? Yes, probably in some ways. But Odin was more to me, I would think, um, you know, more the equivalent perhaps of, you know, the, the divine king, which, you know, might be Zeus, might be the, you know, the ruler of the gods, because Odin was pretty much the ruler of the Norse pantheon. Um. I don't know if there's a clear cut correlation between all the gods of these various panthe pantheons, because I don't think the, the lines of correlation aren't going in nice parallel lines. They're tending to do this and they're tending to bifurcate and they're came, coming back together. You know, they're kind of like the connections could almost be described as anastomosing. And so, yes, I think you can find elements of Tahot in Odin clearly. Um, and that would be something that would really be worth diving into is, is looking at the gods and the, the various stories behind them. Because as we're finding out in, in what Dave Matheson's work confirmed me what I already knew, but it really just presented it. He's just sort of laid out the, the indisputable evidence showing that, you know, the connection between the, the mythic archetypes and the cosmic realm and the correlations that are going on there. But um, yeah, it, it's more like, uh, what would I say? You know, there's, there's a dreamlike quality to mythology is because um, the characters, the main characters in the mythic stories oftentimes undergo metamorphosis, almost chameleon-like or changing form. You know, you've had dreams, Kyle, where somebody is in your dream and then they become somebody else. Yeah, but they're ever, still the same person in a way. It's weird. In a way, yeah. But yeah, something like that. And you probably also had dreams where you're probably stuck out by the side of the road in your underwear. <laughs> you ever had that dream? <laughs> Going to school. <laughs> in I the know. skivvies. <laughs> when we go back to second grade. Hey, I'm sorry about that. We were, we were actually getting serious for a Blushes while. Blushes only. <clears throat> Oops. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we got some more, uh, but the second half of the question, or maybe it was, I don't know if it's a second question or it was connected, but Futhark, uh, the relation of Elder Futhark to Gematria and other uh -huh. numerology. Well, I haven't studied the Futhark enough to have an opinion on that other than the ruins uh, are almost certainly could be used for numerical values, but I have never used them that way. I haven't studied deeply into those. Uh, I've studied much deeper into the, to the, um, the Hebrew and the Greek, uh, and their correlations, their numerical correlations. Now my brother Rowan has actually studied much deeper into the, um, the runic system than I have. So it might be good to actually, uh, get him on here to talk about that sometime. Um, oh, that, you know, and actually yeah, that's, that's kind of my heritage, you know, that Norse system. The Norse stuff um, to me has always been very confusing. I, I, I can't make sense out of it. You know, there's so much weird stuff, uh, from whatever I've read. It's just, I'm just like, wow, this is, well, Hey man, come on, cut us some slack. That's what happens when the winters are 11 and a half months long. <laughs> you know, how would you cope with it? <laughs> Don't know. Never lived in that uh, climate. Oh boy. 
So I've been hot. <laughs> You're a southern boy. Hey, hot. Yes, sir. You a southern boy. All right. Um, we ask Rowan every week if he'll get back on here to have the dual brother system going on. So yeah. he'll be back. That'll be great. And uh, we'll put that on the list for questions for Rowan. Oh, yeah, because then I can tell you stories about Rowan. And he oh, can tell yeah. us stories about that you. That no one else will be able to tell. <laughs> stories that he's kept long buried. We'll ask him about the scissor stabbing incident and see what he thinks. He, he, <laughs> I don't think he knows anything about that. <laughs> sure. See, he's our, you can tell, folks. Yeah, he wasn't he's even preloading it at that point, I guess. Hey, when I'm in second grade, he's not even in kindergarten yet. Right, no, maybe he was right. in maybe he was in kindergarten. <laughs> I think he, he was. All right, we got he, more. Um Jeff the curator. Yep. Miz- ten dollars and eighty cents. Ten eighty. Uh, Missoula uh, mega structure. Yep. Nice. Yeah, he says Missoula megastructure. No, he doesn't. He says <laughs> Missoula <laughs> Maga structure. <laughs> Don't know what that means. Maybe it was a, a faux pas. Yeah. Someone unseen, $10, says, this is beer money. Thanks for what you and you do, Randall and company. Maybe Randall can tease us with some tidbits about the moon. Cheers from Australia. I tell you what, we're going to very soon, Brad and I have talked about it. We've got a, a teaser we're going to do, and it's going to, we got to do it before we go to Montana, uh, we, Washington. Yeah, we do. We do. So, um. How do we contact this person to give this person the first heads up when this thing goes live, goes out? I don't know. They're unseen. It's, oh, it's going to be difficult to find them. Oh. They are just well, someone unseen. That's kind of... Uh... Yeah, but but they're, as far as I remember, pretty much at every live stream. So that's right. we'll be able to give them a heads There's up. There's someone we can't see at every live stream. That's how you find <laughs> the guy. Okay. Did you say we're going to do a cheeser? cheeser yeah wait are we going to be involved in this cheeser or is it just going to be well, randall and brad i think you could now i'm going to do a quick share screen here let's see if i can pull this off now i think i've got the hang of two monitors i'm i'm dreading the thought of getting that third monitor i was gonna say we're about to set you up with three now that you figured two out we're gonna get you the third one well i'm almost there Maybe we get the third one when we get back, and then I'll, I will be ready. Okay, so I'm going to do a share screen. And you said uh, this person is what? What's their title? Someone unseen. Someone unseen. Yes. Well, here is the title slide to my moon presentation. Ah, uh, that's a teaser, folks. There's your teaser. The cheeser. <laughs> the cheeser. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. If we're gonna, if you guys are gonna, if planning on doing some kind of moon presentation, I would love to be involved in that. So let me know. Well, it's only going to be a it's teaser. Be a okay. It's going to be. Yeah. Well, it'll be fifteen minutes, maybe twenty. Okay. Minutes, but yeah, you guys could be in on I it. Mean, actually, you know, it's fine. No, actually, we've been waiting for you to talk to people about the moon for three years we can totally not be involved and when you do it it's totally fine randall it was <laughs> it was <laughs> revealed actually... in part to the scablands group you have heard uh, part of it already yeah Ross. yeah yeah we've heard <laughs> a small part <laughs> you you know i threw a few crumbs at you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to keep you happy keep you from from annoying me from <laughs> from t- Get you guys you. to stop annoying me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got another. This is an interesting comment uh, from okay. Varvis, $5. How loud would the Younger Dryas comets have been? Oh, my God. I think we could answer that. It would have been deafening. Would have been deafening. Yeah. Absolutely deafening. Well, I mean, look, we've got re- recordings of the, uh, the, uh, the last bolide over Siberia. What do we call that one again? The Chelyabinsk. 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 Chelyabinsk, I think, is the way I heard it pronounced. Chelyabinsk. But yeah, I mean, if if you, uh, Bradley. <laughs> Somebody just sent me that a couple hours ago. It's this multi. Oh yeah, yeah. that's a great exposure one. thing. A moon that I don't know if it's brand new, but yeah, somebody just sent me that a couple, like an hour ago. Wow. 
Sorry. Wow. That's a beauty. Well, those, you know, what you just showed there were the Maria. Yeah. And uh, if we talk about the moon, obviously we got to talk about the Maria because when we go out and we look at the moon up in the sky, that's what we're seeing. We're looking at the side of the, the face of the moon with about 95% of all Maria on it. So that raises an interesting question. There's one, one uh, Maria on the backside, almost like in a bullseye. But there's a, an enormous asymmetry to the distribution of surface features on the moon, which raises some interesting questions. Along with this, I'll throw this out, I've put it out before, but this is the thing for people to think about. No matter what time of day, what time of month, what time of year, for year upon year, decade upon decade, century upon century, when you go out and you look at the full moon, you're going to always see the same face. Yeah. And uh, Brad, you were on that call where we had with the gentleman who um, was talking about plasma plumes. I was. And I remember what he kept saying a couple, few times at least, uh, because the moon doesn't rotate. Oh yeah, such right. and such. Uh huh. And I didn't. I was too polite to interject and say, "Yeah, yeah." Time out. Uh, excuse me. The moon does rotate. It does, in fact, rotate. So, Russ, how would you explain that? That the moon rotates, but we always see the same face. It rotates once around its axis for every orbit, single orbit around the Earth. Yes. Yeah. One to one rotation one to orbit. One to one spin ratio yeah. coupling. Yeah. One to one spin orbit coupling. There we go. Yeah. Tidal I mean, locking that's... is another way they talk about it. Yeah. What, how, what do you call Tide, it? Tidal locking. Tidal locking. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Tidal locking. But that raises more questions. And it does, some of these yes. questions that when you start seeking answers to these questions that the moon is posing to us, very overtly, very obviously, right in front of our, hey, look here, you guys. If, uh, you know, if if my orbit was uncoupled from my rotation, you know, I would be able to turn. You would eventually see all sides of the moon, but you don't. So this is this tidal coupling. And uh, how does that work? So it's when you begin to pursue the answer to that question that the anomalies begin to show themselves boom all right and they're rolling in now yeah 757 ten dollars says can we get randall and crew's stance on past space travel and moon landing and maybe artemis one too i'll just throw that in there yeah they delayed it today. now let's mm -hmm. let's uh clarify here past moon landings um are we talking apollo or are we talking Way past, archaic. Uh, That's can a great. You, can uh, you comment on uh, both? Uh, yeah. How about you tell us? Um, about how about you tell us no. about all of them? Nineteen <laughs> sixties. Uh, yeah. Well, once again, um, yes. There's going to be a disclosure coming up, maybe before the year is out. It's just that it has to be done properly. It just can't be sort of a random dump of information because part of the insight here depends upon almost a certain sequence of insights that you gain from looking at these, looking at the whole phenomena from different points of view. And, you know, the way I am, I'm not, I'm, I've never liked just giving people the answers. I like to basically yeah. lay out the evidence and then have people follow that on their own and come to their own conclusions. Okay, can because I ask something specific then about can, this? What do you cuz because I think I think there's line. possibly there's a there's a there's a, a a lot of people that think that the Apollo moon missions were fake. So I'm just curious what you think about that. Oh, Cooper. Well, I mean a lot of people think a lot of things. But, um, In internet, yeah. Um, well, what can I say about that? Other than the fact that, other than the fact that the conspiracy required for that would be so vast and involve so many people 
And I have never really heard anything credible about that. I mean, there was the thing with, um, well, what's his name? Supposedly faked it, but Kubrick. Kubrick. But it would make perfect sense to me that you would want to simulate as much as possible and in as many different ways as you possibly could uh, for a venture like that. But, um, uh, you know, I've deliberately stayed away from that. Just like I'm not going to sure. delve into the flat earth stuff. There's just, you know, there's only so much time to talk about stuff. And we don't get to delve into all of the things that need to be delved in. Um I just say yeah. that I, I think the case for a faked moon landing is really weak. Well, let and, me ask you a question then, because, because yeah, you've, you've gotten up to the point in several of the lecture series that I've been involved in over decades. Right. And that's kind of, it's kind of where it trails off. We get to the moon and then there's never really completion of that or follow through. And the Holy city is like the next after that, after the, the lunar mysteries one. And, you know, we just kind of touched on that. So anyway, this, so this question comes to me and we haven't talked about this. So just as you were saying that, um, is, is Jacob's ladder involved in any way? Ooh. Have you seen the representation of Jacob's ladder in some of the Masonic stuff we've been looking at lately? Uh, not lately. No. Ooh, well, Okay. Then I could uh, pull something up and we could, we could look at it and uh, talk about fun. it a little bit. Uh, do we have another question in the meantime? While I, yeah, I've, yeah, I've some, always been, I've, oh, sorry guys. Yeah. Well, I'll just follow up with that. Cause I've always been fascinated where you've talked about, well, there's, there's three ways that people survived the floods, right? It was by accident or by plan or, a ladder came down from heaven. Oh, sort of there was, mm hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, that opens up a whole big can of worms there. Uh, Bradley, you've just opened a can of worms. <laughs> I've been Boy. holding on to a Let bunch the of worms. worms. Let out. the worms out. <laughs> Kyle DeLille. Our buddy been... Kyle DeLille buddy. sends uh, forty-three dollars and twenty cents. Says it's hey. sacred beer money. Sacred brew money. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Kyle. Really appreciate that. What's going on, my brother? Hope to see Call you again Chuck. on another adventure pretty soon. Is Kyle going to be joining us in the Scablands? I hope. I hope so. Better be going to Egypt. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's on the Egypt trip. Oh, okay. AA gives $5, says, Randall, have you thought about forts? So I think this is Charles Fort, falling animals and blood as relating to the aftermath of Tiamat collision with Marduk. Uh, very good question. Uh, specifically in that, I would say, yeah, the, the whole concept of war in heaven, which has been a very repetitive motif of many myths from all over the world. The, the the falling red rain. Uh, yeah, I'm going to make a note right here because we did, didn't we address that in an earlier podcast? The or red not? Rain? We didn't, no, did we? Not no, yet. We talked about that we'll eventually get to it. We, we are going to, to eventually get to it. I've you been had, threatening to, it. to do a series on none other than the Sangreal. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes. And when yes, we yes. do the Sangreal, we're going to be talking about blood. And when we're talking about blood, we're going to be talking about blood falling from the sky. All right. Are we seeing this uh, Masonic carpet right here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That Check will out really tie the, the right. room together right there. I, I got to get one of those. Yes. It does tie the room together. It does. <laughs> that it does. Well, I tell you what, guys, the full story is right here. If you but knew how to read the symbolism. So over on the right, you can see the ladder that Bradley was referring to. Ah, uh, yes. And, and you'll the see there's stars. angels ascending and descending. And who are these angels? And at the top, look what we got. Seven, Seven stars. stars. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, pick that up. And right at the top of the center, 
in the commanding position of the composition is the all-seeing eye, which has really been subject to a lot of misinterpretation. Right under that, directly under it, what do you see right here? In the comet. Yes, sir. And Ruta. just to make sure it that you make the connection, you've got what right here? Seven stars again. And, and, and the moon. A crescent. Or a crescent. crescent. Yeah. Yes. So you've got a juxtaposition of comet, moon, and Pleiades. Mm -hmm. And I see lots of open books with the Masonic emblem on it. Oh, yeah. That is, those are the holy books that have been handed down to us. Okay. It can be the Bible. It can be the Quran. It can be the Bundahish. It could be the Vedas. It could be the Mahabharata. It could be any number of holy books. It could probably be books written by in the elder Futhark. The knowledge being passed down. Yes. And then it's giving you the key to decoding that knowledge right there mm. with the juxtaposition of the square and compasses on it. Mm -hmm. See, that's what it's showing. it's showing. Right here, here's the holy books that have been handed down, but they're in code. And here's the key to deciphering them right here, right on top, placed overtly where you can't miss it. Yeah, there's a lot going on here that that um, this is a whole story that could yeah, be. I've never seen this one. It's a good one. This is one of my favorites. I guess. And notice, Kyle, here you've got the two pillars. And look, if you look carefully on top, you'll see each one has a globe. Right. One is. All right. All right. So here on this, if you look carefully, you're going to see lines of latitude and longitude. Right. And if you look on this one, you're going to see stars. Mm -hmm. So you've got a terrestrial globe and a celestial globe on top of these Corinthian columns. Corinthian, why? Because there's symbolism in Corinthian. Look at what crowns the, the Corinthian column just under the capital. It's life. It's flowering. It's exuberant life bursting forth from the pillar itself. And the idea there is that when these pillar, pillars are part of a temple or when they're properly placed and oriented, they actually become lines of force. That's the idea here, that life force from the earth is actually traveling up these pillars. And that's being represented by showing that the pillars are blooming, are blossoming at the top. A lot of interesting stuff going on here. So we won't get into all of that. Right here is one of my favorite compositions of all. It's yeah, it Father Time represented as Saturn. Mm, yes, you've shown us that one. the hair of a weeping virgin who's weeping over a broken column. Yes. That's like the, well. But you have a picture of that one, too, that's like yeah, just, just that focused on itself. that image. Yeah. Uh, yes, I itself, do. Which is really, mm -hmm. really a good one, too. Yes, I do. And I okay. note there was a coffin at the very bottom yeah, of that picture, too. That yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, there was a coffin right at the very bottom with a plant growing out of it. Mm. What was the plant? I didn't didn't mm. see. We didn't could, see that, huh? that. All right, so we got more. Uh, yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah, that was great. That's what we're here for. Yeah, right. Psilocybe Atlantis, $9.99, and it, the comment is 10 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and the what maybe it's a rating yeah it could be ten. a rating 10 uh the, counter stream the number one zero the number 10 counter stream one dollar 99 cents what is your view on ufos <laughs> they exist I'm gonna have to add well some let me put it this way one. there's various ideas out there about ufos um and i don't think i think they're all wrong they're all wrong Everyone's That's wrong. That's my folks. own opinion. But it's, you know, it's not opinion just based on, you know, the, 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 you know, motive of having an opinion just for the sake of having an opinion. I think I'll put it this way. I think what it is, is I, I don't think it's not what people think it is. Let me put it that way. It is something and it's very real, but it's not what people think it is. I agree with that. And sure. I would talk more about it, except for the fact that once I talk about it, all hell could break loose. Well, a lot of people think a lot of different things, so I don't know if you can just say well, what I, people think. Well, but it's fun to just say different things. Wrong. But I have a feeling Pretty that uh, 
<laughs> that I am justified in saying that. But we shall see. We shall see. We got a response from someone unseen, another 20 bucks. It says, awesome, thank you. I am subscribed. I will. Ch I check for content all the time. So if there's a moon presentation, I will see it. All right. Wouldn't mind a Randall trip to Oz, to Australia, but I can't afford a Super Chat big enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we need to go to sure. Australia. Yeah, we need to go to Australia. No doubt. Jeff says uh, the MAGA structure was a typo also Meg, okay oh, Meg, yeah it was mega Meg, structure mega. <laughs> that's what he meant to say <laughs> i was like i'm not sure what you're trying to say there but yeah yeah what is he yeah. saying mega structure and the missoula we've, we've MAGA had people structure. from australia from oz uh on on the very very first tours with us there and we uh, did yeah Pagosa springs and we've got somebody coming out uh, to the scablands with us so yeah that's uh, i know rail has got a lot of fans out there and they're curious uh about their own geology and topography that they're asking all the time for us to focus in on and uh i know rail's going to get to that but yeah that's high on the list of places we want to go for sure uh new phase 42 dollars says randall let's talk about american giants skeletons gone missing could the destruction of forests due to mega floods have caused an oxygen depletion curbing gigantism mm. hmm. that's a Interesting question. Repeat the question, would you, Russ? Okay, so, can, so can, really... first, first, let's talk about the American giant skeletons gone missing, and then says, okay. could the destruction of forests due to mega floods have caused an oxygen depletion, which curbed the gigantism? Okay, let me think about Ooh. that. So, this is a good friend of ours. Yes. Uh, it's not Bruce, is it? No. Okay. Um. I'm trying to think if would forest destruction cause a depletion of oxygen? What would happen is that a lot of carbon dioxide would be released into the atmosphere. Now, if, if photosynthesis is proceeding, I mean, photosynthesis is constantly replenishing oxygen in the atmosphere because, you know, when you take up a carbon dioxide, you're looking at two molecules of oxygen, one molecule of carbon, and one molecule of oxygen is being consumed by the plant and the other is being released into the atmosphere. I can't answer that question without thinking about it. Um, I, up to this point, now up to this point, I've always thought that the, um, you know, and like when you, let's use the, uh, the pygmy mammoths as an example. <clears throat> if you've got a species that has a restricted habitat, its terrain and its food source is limited, it seems that that favors the smaller individuals, which leads over a period of multiple generations to a general diminishment in the size of the species. And we saw that with um, with mammoths that, for example, were survived on some of the islands. The Wrangell Islands, I believe, was one of the places of refuge where mammoths lived down to maybe 5,000, 6,000 years ago, but they were incredibly smaller like half the size <clears throat> did oxygen supply have anything to do with that i don't know i certainly think that you know a restricted habitat you know was uh responsible for the restricted size but uh i think yes it could be related to the catastrophe the post world the post catastrophic world although you know the the the, the younger driest extinction event did not <clears throat> wipe out all the megafaunal species, only about half of them. I mean, there were still big animals left in the aftermath, but their numbers had been reduced by about half, uh, the numbers of species. So I, I don't know, you know, interesting questions. Um, I wish I had, you know, well thought out, articulated answers for all of them, but I don't. Uh, but it certainly gives me some things to think about. And I'm making notes as we're going here, things to look up to try to learn more about this. Um, Those giants come up regularly. And I think it was just in one of our telegram groups from one of the prior tours. And uh, they were saying that uh, they had seen somebody, one of these people that said, well, I was the guy that they sent out into the boat in the ocean. And we dumped those giants bones into the bottom of the ocean. 
really yeah i have heard how verifiable that is but somebody just sent that in our in our group telegram earlier today well i'd like to see that verified because that would certainly uh alleviate the need for anybody with the smithsonian to say no we're not hiding any giant skeletons here in our basement (laughs) if they were in fact dumped in the middle of the ocean Mm -hmm. why would they why would they do that though what are they afraid of if that was the case i mean i'm going to go ahead and i think i'll pull up a couple of things here just um yeah i'll I'll track that down because yeah i just saw it whatever in the last couple hours so um when we start looking at the mound uh architecture the monumental earthwork of america they and you start looking at some of the um some of these uh this earthen infrastructure that pre-existed the arrival of the Europeans. It is on a phenomenal scale. And it is really hard to wrap your head around when you realize that, you know, the stuff that's there still stamped is maybe only five to 10% of what was here. Um, And I think there's a lot of questions. And again, this is something else we need to dive into uh, in depth because it's such a fascinating um, area of exploration. And a lot of people don't realize the extent Um, But I'm going to just get into one of the things a little bit here uh, relative to a discussion of the mound builders, who they were. Um, So this is, I'm going to go just take a a minute here, if if that's okay with you guys. Sure. We got plenty Mm -hmm. more comments too, lots of them. So Okay. So this is from Cyrus Thomas, remarks in the preface to report on the mound explorations of the Bureau of Ethnology, 1890 through 1891. Um, the opinion held by Major J.W. Powell that the Indians found inhabiting the Atlantic Division of North America and their ancestors were the builders of the mounds in that region, which the explorations of the Bureau of Ethnology under his charge have done much to confirm, has been adopted. <clears throat> okay, so this is... Now, when a certain dogma, in other words, what it's saying here is at this point, this became the official dogma that the North American Native Americans, it was their ancestors, direct ancestors that were builders of the mounds. And to basically suggest any other possibilities, in spite of the fact that indigenous traditions themselves seem to indicate uh, an alternative interpretation, this has been the dominant one that if you're a serious academic, you can't really question <clears throat> this dog, but just let's look at a couple of things here. Like, um, so yeah, this is from the work on the great Hopewell road by Joseph M. Knapp, 1998, the federal government was instrumental in fostering the veer towards quote unquote rationality in mound builder matters, specifically through the creation of the Smithsonian Institution of the Division of Mound Exploration Bureau of Ethnology. Um, So Cyrus Thomas was appointed director of this activity and in 1894 published a summary titled report on the mound explorations of the Bureau of Ethnology. In addition to developing the framework of North American Indian culture areas and mound classification, it's still largely in use today. So this was as late as 1998. So in other words, what they did is they established a framework for interpretation that has not uh, tolerated really any dissension in, in that idea that there could have been other entities or cultures or other groups involved in the creation of the mounds. It was simply the direct or not quite so direct ancestors of the Native Americans that were found living in the regions of the mounds. Okay, so this is, um, this I think this is important to understand that there is, <clears throat> there is an officially um, accepted dogma uh, about these. Uh, so let's see, let's look at a couple of things here that uh, like, uh, I'll just take the, this is, you can find many, many examples of this. Um, I know that one of the pseudo skeptics has just written a book claiming that all of this is part of a conspiracy to uh, establish the, 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 uh, the dominance of white supremacy. But when you go back and you look at the sheer quantity of things that are consistent with what I'm about to read, 
I don't think we can just dismiss it that somebody back in 1818 was putting forward this whole contrived scenario or this narrative to put forward the idea of white supremacy. But anyways, this is from the Reverend Elias Cornelius. It appeared in 1818 in Silliman's American Journal of Science and Art. Okay. <clears throat> and it was published in the annual report of the Bureau of Ethnology. He says, and I quote, I have but one more article of curiosity to mention under this division. It is one of those artificial mounds which occur so frequently in the Western country. I have seen many of them, but never of, uh, of one of such dimension as that which I am now to describe. It is situated in the interior of the Cherokee Nation on the north side of the Etowah, one of the branches of the Kusi. Of these great works of art, the Indians gazed with as much curiosity as any white man. I inquired of the oldest chief if the natives had any tradition respecting them, to which he answered in the negative. I then requested each to say what he supposed was their origin. Neither could tell, though all agreed in saying they were never put up by our people. It seems probable they were erected by another race who once inhabited the country. Now, this has been repeated over and over and over again. And the only way to get around it is to basically invoke the idea that this was some conspiracy, right? But nowhere in this in this quote is it saying, oh, it was put up by white people. It was just saying, no, we don't know. We got here and they were already here. Okay. So, um, and this is from René Chateaubriand in his Voyages to America, published in 1826, <clears throat> who interacted with multiple Native tribes, um, learned about their traditions, their myths, and so on, asked them directly about the origins of the great earthworks. And this was what he wrote in his Voyages to America. The Indians are in agreement in saying that their fathers came from the West. They found the works of the Ohio just as they are to be seen today. But the date of this migration of the Indians from the west to the east varies according to the nations. Another tradition claims that the works of the Ohio were raised by white Indians. These white Indians, according to the Red Indians, were to have come from the east. And when they left the lake without shores, they came dressed like pale faces of today. Now, is that true or not? I don't know. But there are many accounts that are consistent with that. Um, anyways, <clears throat> we can go on with that. Um, yeah, so uh, re remarks by Squire and Davis regarding William Bartram's manuscript on the Southern Indians, Travels in North America. So I'm, I'm going to skip over the whole quote because we're going to do a whole, we'll do a whole series on the, on the great monumental earthworks. Um, yes. Because it's a critically Please. important and interesting part of the history of, of this country that is not known. <clears throat> but I'll just read this. Uh, in his travels, and this is uh, William Bartram, he remarks that the region in which they are most abundant, that is the great earthworks, was occupied subsequently to the arrival of the Europeans by the Cherokees, who were afterwards dispossessed by the Creeks. That, quote, all this country was probably many ages preceding the Cherokee nation inhabited by a single nation or confederacy governed by common laws, possessing like customs and speaking the same language, but so ancient that neither the Creeks nor the Cherokee nor the nations they conquered could render any account by whom or for what purposes these monuments were erected. And I could go on, I could go on and on and on. Um, with, with quotes like this, dozens of them. Somebody <clears throat> just sent something also, again, in one of these telegram groups, because the, the people that are on these tours with us, you know, they, they maintain an ongoing discussion. So they had sent something that they've, there's two 20 foot high mounds on the campus of LSU. That's what I was going to, I was about uh, to throw that in. Where I it, got the story yeah, pulled up. Yeah. yeah. If you, you probably might remember more than me, but yeah, that's Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yeah. So this was um, on, on August 22nd, they, they released this thing that the, the oldest mound is 11,000 years old based on their, their dating. They took, uh, cores out and, so see, they, and there we the go. And was, see, it was being built. The first mound was being built up until like 8,000 years ago. And then it stopped because of a climatic event. It changed like 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Then nobody was building on it for about 1,000 years or 1,500 years maybe. They came back in like 7,000 something or whatever and um, started building another mound. 
and then they they kind of aligned the mounds. So it's like a different people, mm -hmm. obviously, or generations pass. So anyway, that's I just found that fascinating. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> yeah, that they dated it. What what is it? Eleven thousand years yeah. ago, they started building that's this. A mound. very old. Yeah. Mound. Well, li well, listen to this. The... Oh, go ahead, Randy. Oh. You're probably talking about the same thing. Go ahead. Maybe so. This is from. Uh... A letter by James Wright to John Bartram. He was one of the earliest, look him up, he was one of the earliest naturalists um, who wrote and documented the natural history of, of America. This is a letter from 1762, an Indian account of Big Bone Lick and legends concerning it. Now, Bradley and I have been to Big Bone Lick. It's up in uh, near the Kentucky, Ohio border. And it's a it's a it's a bog that uh, a lot of mastodon remains are found in. And so early explorers and settlers saw these huge skeletons protruding up out of the peat and up out of the bog <clears throat> and uh, led, you know, uh, people to believe that they were monsters and that they were possibly still living in the Western wilderness. Um, anyways, let me read from this letter. Um, Pursuant to thy request, I have made as particular an, a particular an inquiry relating to those bones thou mentions as I possibly could <clears throat> from two sensible Shawanese Indians assisted by an interpreter. <clears throat> and the substance of what they say is as follows. The place where they lie is about three miles from the Ohio. Salt and moist because it was a salt lick. That's why it's called a big bone lick. There are big bones found there. And it was a natural salt lick. So you had animals coming there to lick the salt. Okay. So as well as I could judge by their description of it, it seems to contain 30 or 40 acres in the midst of a large savanna on the east side of the river that there appear to be the remains of entire skeletons and added that by the bones, they judged the creature when alive must have been the size of a small house. On being questioned, if they had seen such bones in any other place, they said they had seen many such scattered here and there in that large tract of land mentioned before, some upon the surface and some partly burned, which I find interesting, but all much more decayed by time than those they had been describing and not any entire skeleton. I asked if they had ever heard from their old men, if they or their fathers, had ever seen such any such large creatures living? They answered they had never heard of them other than as the condition they are at present, or ever heard of any such creatures having been seen by the oldest man or his father, that they had indeed a tradition that such mighty creatures once frequented those savannas, and that there were then men of a size proportionable to them who used to kill them that they had seen mm -hmm. marks in rocks, which tradition said were made by these great and strong men that when there were no more of these strong men left alive, God had killed these last five that had been questioned about, about which the interpreter said was to be understood. They supposed them to have been killed by lightning. These, the Shawanese said, were their traditions, and as to what they knew, they had told it. And then, jumping forward to 1877, the mound builders in the Rock River Valley of Illinois by James Shaw and the annual report of the Smithsonian Institution. He's describing finding stone hatchets, axes, and skinning stones quite plentifully. The finest in the writer's connection was plowed up among the Kishwaki mounds. The Hanover mounds have furnished, now these are coming out of these artificial mounds, right? The Hanover mounds have furnished a 10 pound axe, a very perfect shape. But the largest one in this section is in Dr. Everett's collection. It weighs one ounce over 15 pounds. It is of a dark color. The shape is artistic. The external boundary lines are all graceful curves and only a giant could have wielded it. Oh, and then we could talk about <laughs> what was found in some of these mounds when they were excavated. Oh, yeah. Yep. 
and I'm just gonna. Dude, we gotta do some. We gotta do this. We got. Yeah, we gotta go through I was this on this on. We Cosmo, gotta do the man. Giants. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is one of my okay. We'll subjects. leave it at there. We'll leave it at that. We should leave it at that. Yeah. We got plenty more comments. And yeah, because questions. there's a whole lot more that we can dive into. So that's what I'm saying. We 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 need to do a a series devoted to to the archaic America and the antiquities of America because it's a hell of a story. Heck yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to bring up Watson breaks. So that's just another one that's uh, yeah. Bring it up. Kind of. Yeah. And I was well, just, that'll be part of that ongoing thing once we, once we do it. But yeah, as far as an 11,000 year old discovery. <clears throat> yeah. This, this thing is the uh, more, uh, with volume, right? The dirt and soil moved and then is uh in the Great Pyramid. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. So it was out there in Louisiana. So it was Poverty Point. Many times more material than is found in the Great Pyramid. Yes. <clears throat> That's fascinating stuff. Yeah, we'll, it is. we'll let Randall dig into that coming up. Heck yeah. Go ahead, guys. Sorry. All right. Sergeant Gray, ten bucks, asks, Do you think the moon could be somewhat hollow? So yes well, let's no. put it this way. If you look at the moon <laughs> overall, it appears that the overall density of the moon is uh, about the same as that of a granitic rock. Um, yes, there could be a deficiency of mass within the lunar interior, but the exact configuration of that mass is uh, has to be defined with a little bit more um a little bit more accuracy yeah. in order. To, it's not like a simple hollow sphere like some people have imagined it. When it gets back around to the, the mare being on the base pointing to us and maybe only one on the other side. Yeah. Yes. All so right. just all I'm going to say is just don't hold your breath, but just wait for the full disclosure, which will be coming up sometime at, at whatever point I cave into the pressure, <laughs> more pressure coming up no, soon. But actually, not, I'm, I'm not waiting for the soon. I'm waiting pressure for the signal. On. Okay, I'm okay. waiting for the signal. Once I get the sing- signal, then I'll go. Okay, I'm letting it all out, guys. You get the signal. All right, you UFO pilot, UFO out there are giving him the signal. Oh. <laughs> That's right. The signal. All you, all you Cynthia's and Diana's start start calling Randall. <laughs> all right, from David Stig Hansen. 109. I think he said later that this was he meant this to be 108. Oh. $109. Totally screwed well, that, that up, David. Who who is this from? <laughs> David. David <laughs> Hansen. We, we met him. Well, in, David, hey, he listen, that 109 is cool because actually the sun is 109 times the diameter of the earth. All right. So there so you go. You did okay, David. So he says in Sedona, Randall Lucky. told me if I was a flat earther, he'd be tempted to throw me out of his rented Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> Did you threaten okay. to throw? So I bet you you're had stabbing scissors people too. with scissors. You had scissors. You're, you're threatening, threatening to throw people out of your car. <laughs> well, look, I would have pulled over and stopped first. Okay. <laughs> Just you remember the scene from The Big Lebowski when he objected to the taxi drivers playing the Eagles. Yeah, playing the Eagles. Yeah, I mean yeah. that would yeah. be. You know, I might assist them a little in getting out. Right. <laughs> but I would have not thrown them out while we were in while, motion. Okay. All right. While in motion, yeah. <laughs> Seven fifty-seven gives ten dollars to Brad to Geocosmic Rex for the can of worms. Thank you, Brad. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> got me a new can opener. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, don't, yeah, we won't go there. But. Yeah, Brad, Brad's a good guy to pay off for, like, yeah, know, yeah. getting Randall to yeah, talk yeah. about things. That's right. That's that's yeah. a brilliant scheme, guys. It is a great that's scheme. That's right. That Brad up. is Brad is a su- suitable for this since apparently he has worms. So. <laughs> cans of them. He has cans of them. That's right. He, he knows how cans. to open them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Tom Simon gives two hundred dollars. No comment. Thank you so much, Tom. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, who is that? Tom. 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 Simon. Tom. Oh, awesome man. Let's put it to good use. Yes. That's awesome, brother. Thank you. Maybe we can feed Brad for another few days. <laughs> pizza and beer. Keep Brad Brad and pizza and beer. <laughs> R. Nicole, 1999 or 20 bucks. Could asteroids have created the large mountain ranges in the Alps? The rate of erosion seems to be similar to the rate of uplift. So how could they how would they have grown up so high if that is true? Well, okay, interesting question. And I think that yes, that is possible. Um, actually the rate of erosion 
is slower than the rate of uplift because if let's imagine that the rate of erosion was the same as the rate of uplift, they would be worn down as fast as they would lift be lifted up and they exa- basically wouldn't exist. But what yeah, we see what is saying, that yeah. they do exist. You know, we have mountains that are, yeah. So the, this gets down to a question of what's called in the geological or geophysical community orogenesis, the, the the origin of mountains and mountain building, which is now described in terms of plate tectonics, which I think is likely probably the main part of the explanation where you have compressive forces, right? And typically several things can happen. You can have an uplift like this. You can have an overthrust and a buckling which you see all of these uh, different configurations of mountains. Uh, But the question is, is now the assumptions in continental drift and plate tectonic theory is that this lateral motion is being driven by forces within the mantle, right? That there's upwelling. We we use the example of the the, uh, mid Atlantic Ridge as a, as a uh, separation Ridge where the two plates are moving apart right? And stuff is welling up. So there you have tensional forces wanting to pull apart, but where plates are colliding, you have the uplift. Those are compressional forces. Now, do I think it's possible that asteroid impacts could be playing a role? Yes, absolutely. I do. I've thought that many, many years that, that great impacts could in fact, even be driving uh, internal responses within the asthenosphere, within the mantle itself. Um, so yes, I, I think that's very possible that, and I th- actually would like to dive into that further and talk about mountain building. Um, and, you know, w- Brad will, we've looked at those frequently up there in the Canadian Rockies, particularly some of these tremendous oh, yeah. overthrusts that are just like, wow. And and you realize that, you know, as, as the uplift occurs, s- the higher it gets, the more the erosive forces accelerate. Because once you get into the freeze thaw cycle, now you have a means for for exponentially increasing the rate of the destruction yeah, of the rocks and, and all that from the from exactly the exactly. So, I think that you, I think that the likely scenario, perhaps within the framework of the new catastrophism, is that mountain building episodes are rapid and short lived, and then the erosion of those mountains is much more protracted and drawn out. And then that there might be several episodes where the uplift occurs repeatedly uh, before the mountains are actually, you know, completely worn away. When you look at the Appalachian Mountains of of the southeastern United States, they were once huge, prominent, bare rocks, very much as the Alps or the Rockies. But now the remains of those rocks are what builds the Piedmont to the east and builds the Cumberland Plateau to the west. That material that comprises the Cumberland Plateau on the west and the Piedmont of Georgia and the Carolinas on the east, that was material eroded off the uplands of these huge mountains, huge mountain range that the Appalachians once were. All right. Sorry, I got a little bit distracted there from the chat. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Trying to keep an eye on what's going on in there. There's, there's It's wild in there tonight. Uh, so Trapzilla, 10 bucks, says, Randall, you are my hero. Have you seen the Templar Night Cup made from ebony glass? No, nah, I want to see that. Post a picture of it. Who's this? This yeah, is who? Trapzilla. Says Trapzilla. it would take 200 to 400 years of precise tapping to make such an item. Do you Ooh, have any I want to see this? a post. If you got a photograph or a source on that, post it, man. We, we, oh, Let's we can check it out. It, yeah. Maybe Brad can find it. Okay. Okay, let's see. And by the way, all thank right, you guys all again. so much for all these chats. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, But we are getting close to the end here, so just letting you know, we probably can't handle more. Just want to let you know. Uh, Peter Shell, $216. No comment. Pete. Thanks for Peter. Wow. Appreciate awesome, that, buddy. Peter. Thank you so he's, much. He's coming west with us again. Hell yeah. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Is that the, that's Peter. We yeah, that's Peter. Saw. We know Peter. Yeah, he was just yeah. in Nashville too. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, Peter. You're awesome, dude. Go check out his channel. Huh? Much appreciated. Night slant, five dollars. What's that cool hexagonal shape with the lines and circles called? 
cool hexagonal shape with lines and circles. Um, hexagonal shape mm. with well, lines and circles. There. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's North not, po- yeah. North Pole of Saturn. <laughs> Cool hexagonal star, with lines star, and circles. What's the, what's the other one? The uh, Aaron gives another two dollars. Um, says Mega Moon episode, please. <laughs> so Mega Moon. Another, Mega yeah, Moon. <laughs> asking okay. for a Moon episode. Uh, Gothicus. Lunacy. Do, do the Masons use a secret jargon? How do I find out more info? Who said that? Who Gothicus. Said? Tom did. No, Gothicus. Gothicus. Yes. Well, do you have secret? Best words? way to find out more is to join. petition the craft yeah. and join. Yes, that's the, really the only effective way. I mean, you can read about it in books, but it's really it's a participatory experience that really conveys the insights. And yes, yeah, there is jargon, and you can learn that jargon. It's all been you're probably on the internet now. But let me put it this way: <clears throat> it's the, the 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 Masonic ritual is a very carefully developed over many centuries uh, ceremony ritual that's designed to to open your mind and your spirit and your emotions to certain realities and if you water it down by going oh I've learned the jargon and the secret handshakes and I know what they do here and I know what they do there what you've just done is you have eliminated any possibility of you having that experience of going through and having those those events, those experiences um, as part of your framework of reality. Um, you know, I use the analogy and it's not really a, it's kind of a poor analogy, but it's sort of accurate in that, you know, if you were about to go see some, you know, some mystery, a, a, a mystery thriller with, you know, lots of plot changes and then a, a, a um, you know, a major turning point at the end, a, um, you know, a plot twist at the end uh, with a surprise ending. And part of the impact of that movie is, is the fact that you're going through trying to work out perhaps with the, um, with the protagonist, you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Like take the movie Chinatown, that entire movie, almost every single scene, Jack Nicholson was in that, in almost every scene in that movie. Well, the reason was, is because the director was very carefully wanting the viewer to experience this unfolding of events through the eyes of the, of the protagonist, who in this case happened to be the detective who's trying to figure this out so that you're basically trying to figure out what these things mean at the same time, the, the, the main character in the movie is trying to figure these things out. If you already know all of this, well, then why even bother to go see the movie? You know, you've just deprived yourself of the really the pleasure of seeing this movie and, and gaining the insight because interestingly, the movie was based upon real historical events that you can then get behind and go, yes, there really was the St. Francis Dam failure that killed many, many people. And it was a huge scandal. And yes, there was a, there was a, uh, you know, there was a scandal involving water and the, um, you know, the, the, the distribution of water and all of these other things that created huge scandals that nobody knows about in the history of the formation of Los Angeles. But here's the point, you know, you don't want to go and just start learning because the jargon is itself, not just some randomly chosen thing. It has meaning within the framework of the whole experience. So I don't advise anybody to go and just, you know, try to learn all that because for what reason? What reason would that be that you would want to learn that? Well, I mean, the the valid reason is because you want to become a participant in that experience. And that experience involves multiple dimensions of, 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 of uh, involvement. Um, So for example, you not only get, have a massive tome opened up, filled with amazing information and given the keys to decipher that, you're also, you're also encouraged to engage in a moral life that t- tends to uplift your fellow man and relieve the suffering of this world. And that goes hand in hand with the value of the information that is being inculcated through this 
through this Masonic process. And so if you're not willing to, to lead a life where your goal in life is to leave this world a better place than you came into it, there's no reason for you to even bother or worry about, you know, what the meaning of these symbols and the jargon actually is. If you're really interested, then what I would do is, yeah, go ahead and do some research, but then eventually walk the walk, go in and, and, um, go through that outer door into the temple and find out for yourself what this is, this system that's been handed down for millennia. That's cool. Didn't mean to go off on a lecture here. But no, that's good. I'm thinking no, about it. Great. Yeah, we still, we're still thinking about joining too. Want to, want to do it? We do it. Yeah, when the time is right. Yeah, <clears throat> the time is right. All but right, it would be great, great cuz I'd love to come down there to you guys' area and sit and lodge with you guys. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, be and great. you guys come up here and we we'll go over and yeah. And uh you guys didn't see the lodge room that we held the um except on video, right? Where we held the the sacred geometry workshop. Saw some pictures, yeah, we but yeah, we weren't there, there, yeah. Yeah, nice room. <clears throat> nice room. So Oh yeah. All right, okay. Greg, Greg Mills, 20 bucks, asks, what do you think of the expanding Earth theory based on the 8,000 tons of micrometeor impacts every year? 8,000 tons of micro... Well, that's utterly minuscule compared to the mass of the Earth. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, but still, it, it's got to be getting bigger, right? <laughs> It's got to be getting, it's accreting <laughs> it mass to it. Getting bigger. It's Hey, yeah. we could do some quick calculations here. If everybody wants to just sit quiet, contemplate for five or 10 everybody minutes. Everybody get can, your calculators out. <laughs> everybody get your calculators it's out. Calculator What's the mean time. density of the earth? About 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter, I believe. thousand years. We can do its volume if we take its its radius of 33,960. We multiply, we raise that, we cube that, multiply it by pi over three, we'll get the volume. Then we can insert 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. We can get the overall mass of the earth from that. Um, I don't think we want to do that right now, though, do we? Interesting question. But we're though. so close. So I don't, I mean, you started. I, I can't, let me put it this way. I don't think we would notice the earth growing, let's say, Certainly not on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, but what about over millions of years, you know, like over geological time, you know? Is well, it... look, I mean, the, what is the main uh, theory of planetary formation? It's gravitational accretion. Sure. Right. That's so, right. I mean, why couldn't that still be going on? Sure, yeah. that's That's what I'm plausible. saying. So, technically, the expand, you know, expanding Earth is, yeah. That, that, that's kind of the way I've looked yeah. at it too. Standard, the standard model is basically an expanding Earth idea. It's just over longer periods over of time. Over very long periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Robert, two bucks, asks when you're going to go back on Joe Rogan. Good question. Uh, maybe before the year is out, but I'm guessing if not before the year is out, probably early next year. October sounds good. But I'll be back out there, I'm sure, now that the boys, you know, are out there not too far from San Antonio, or from Austin, rather. Yeah. Um, I'll probably be out there for several reasons. Um, Heck yeah, man. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, Always we still got to go Always. see uh, um, the cave. The cave. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah. Yep. And we got to go see, uh, we want to go down to... Um, Big Bend, we've been talking about. Big Bend, about. that's what oh, I was yeah. trying to... What It'd I be was, cool to get yeah. over to uh, the Glen Rose Formation, too, in Paluxy, and look at all the dinosaur tracks. They're yeah. famous. See, there's oh, all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. So... Before it gets too hot. I would probably, you know, uh, piggyback a Joe Rogan appearance on something like that. Yeah. Because <clears throat> I'm still wanting to get Joe out. Listen, man, maybe we need to start say. a... Um, a campaign joe you need to get your ass out of the studio into the wild into right. the into these landscapes the <laughs> and see yes get out in the field and see some of this stuff we've been talking about firsthand because i guarantee you man it'll stretch your brain as much as any mushroom would we could do some fear factor stuff and like yeah go, yeah. go into a and then in fact if crickets. you combine <laughs> the the landscapes with mushrooms now that's 
beyond we we can't even talk about we can't, that. Yeah, it's not a lot to talk. We've got to evolve the podcast, right? So, way to do that is get out of the studio, out into the field, out yeah. into the field. Just yeah, I, I would like well, to so get, far you haven't convinced him, him Randall. List. So far, I what? You haven't convinced him yet. Well, I haven't tried very hard, but no. I've certainly planted the seeds. Should threaten him with kids. some scissors. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Or push him out of your car. <laughs> Shove you out of my car, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yep, that's coming though. What pushing Joe out of the Cadillac? <laughs> well, another <laughs> Rogan with episode. Oh, oh, with oh another, and, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, getting him out in the field to do something. Yeah, there's so many things in Texas to show him. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, j- just in case you're listening, Joe. In all seriousness, I do not endorse any of those ideas that were just. <laughs> put forward by my colleagues he, he no longer has the cadillac <laughs> and i no longer have the cadillac that's right okay david the one you threatened to throw out of the car is asking again for 10 bucks where were the mounds built by giants he says that's what lincoln said Did, is that what lincoln said well lincoln, lincoln said lincoln's wrote made a comment about the eyes of that extinct species of, of giants, giants who once gazed on niagara as we do now yeah he all... didn't say that they built the mounds, right. as far as I know. Well, let's see. Here's the Antiquities of Kansas City, Missouri, published in 1877 by W.H.R. Likens, that also appeared in the annual report of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, we have lately made a discovery here of a number of Indian mounds, which are evidently of great antiquity. They're situated on the north side of the Missouri River, in the angle of the great bend upon the high bluffs commanding a view of the country about the mouth of the Kansas River directly opposite. He goes on describing um, a little bit more, and then he says, um, we have not yet made any extended investigation of these mounds, but examined partially one group of five in the center of number one at a depth of about five feet. We found a human skeleton. The bones were so fragile that we could only get them out in fragments. We did not notice any very marked peculiarity as to these bones, except their great size and thickness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's, yeah. I just realized that the the Lincoln quote, he does say that the, whose bones fill the mounds of America. That's what he said. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Didn't say they built them, though. That's right. I don't know if this is the proper um, pronunciation, coniot, coniot, but. Anyway, this is from the Historical Collections of Ohio in two volumes, an encyclopedia of the state that was published in 1888. <clears throat> the first permanent settlement of in Coniot was in 1799. When the settlers arrived, some 20 or 30 Indian cabins were still standing. There were mounds situated in the eastern part of the village of Coniot and an extensive burying ground near the Presbyterian Church, which appear to have had no connection with the burying places of the Indians. Among the human bones found in the mounds were some belonging to men of gigantic stature. Some of the skulls were of sufficient capacity to admit the head of an ordinary man and jaw bones that might have been fitted on over the face with equal facility, and the other bones were proportionately large. Now, was that in Ohio? That was in Ohio. Yeah. <clears throat> Imagine yeah, a, a skull a... that they were able to put over their own heads. Like, yeah. like a helmet, yeah. Like a helmet. Now, yeah, oh, a, but they're a... all making this up because it's yeah. part of a conspiracy it to was, promote white supremacy. Hoax fad. Yeah, that's what we call it, a hoax fad. <laughs> it was, uh-huh. you know, all these different people just decided to make the same hoax. Yeah. Yep, yep. I remember hearing of a Conneaut Lake, but that, I was so young. I don't know if that was the accurate pronunciation, but Conneaut, does it like start with a C? Yes. Conneaut Lake. Yeah. So I was too far from where I was. Maybe fairly close. Up. Yeah. All right. Well, I think well, there's we're... a lot more to dive into along that subject matter for sure. Yes. And we yeah. will. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time tonight. We are up on time. Brad, you got. Uh, Announcements? Announcements. 
That was a beautiful mix of topics. That's great stuff. Yeah, that was great. I love this. Yeah. I love doing this, and I love the questions. It's awesome, yes. everybody. Yeah. really appreciate thank, it. Thank you all oh, yeah. people that are here with us live and the contributions and Super Chats. It's excellent. Yep, and I got a bunch of bunch more good, bunch good more flow. names to read off yeah. from the lots of yeah. ideas for jokes too. Yeah. Great jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, at the end here, Counter Stream five dollars. Thank you, Tim, Tim Sweeney eight sixty two, Jim in fifty bucks, uh, Cody five dollars, Matt Dieball t- twenty bucks, Cody again twenty dollars again, uh, Maxter Chief two bucks. Logan, $5. Jim N, 20 bucks, And Adam Brown, $5. Thank you guys so much. Oh, really? Super Thanks, chats. Guys. Sorry yeah. we couldn't get to the to the questions there. I know the answer to one is the high ground in the during the the uh, Younger Dries floods would be Stepto Butte. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we will be going to Stepto Butte. And I got to yeah, say that that is one of the most spectacular vistas that I've seen in my life. I agree. It's right up there in the top three or four, I think. Pretty amazing. Oh, and Crypto Chris just gave 200 bucks. Thank you so oh, much, wow. buddy. Awesome, oh, yeah. dude. Awesome. Thank you. Bonus. Thank you, Crypto. Yeah. So, yeah, I would just, you know, summarize it all as just sign up for the Rental Carlson newsletter. Yeah. There you and go. you'll get information on all the other events, everything that's coming up, everything that's happening. And that comes out the first Saturday of each month. So, Randall's uh, tidying up some final. Uh, writings about some recent scientific papers to go with that. And we've got the upcoming trips and tours and uh, new things that are, that are in the works, the the sanctuary project. Yeah. So all that's included monthly in that newsletter. So that's the best way to keep up with what's going on. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, it's all, it's always in the links. It may not be here right now when we're live, but I always add it. So it's randallcarlson.com slash newsletter. Hopefully you can't get much more simple than that and sign up there with your email and you'll get one uh, coming up next Saturday, not this Saturday, following Saturday. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> All right just, guys. I'll just add that I'm reminding people until it, the word gets spread that um, the use of my name and the sales of my, oh, yes. my work and use of my likeness and all over at sacred geometry international is illegal and I receive nothing if you patronize that site. So um, just want to keep that word out so people know. And everything authentically, Randall, and my friends and colleagues and all of you is going to be at randallcarlson.com. There you go, folks. Here we are. Yep. Thank you guys so much. And Andrew, thanks for the $10 at the end here. And thanks to everybody else who super chatted. And thanks to all of you in the chat yeah, hanging so out. Thank you all. Yeah, us. really, man. That's what makes this so much fun. Yeah. It was no a great time. We need, we need you. We there. love you. All right. Good night, folks. Cool. Good night, everyone. Good night. All right, ciao.